I love you. There's this great scene in that Mr. Peabody and whatever his Sherman, thank you. Where Sherman goes, I love you, Mr. Peabody. Mr. Peabody goes, I have a high regard for you too, Sherman. <laughs> I love you. There's all kinds of joking around in the room because there's a certain level of discomfort with saying this to each other. My friend Johnny from college, he was my roommate in college, decided to actually say these words to me every time we ended a conversation, in person or on the phone. <laughs> I love you. And the first time he said it, I said, Johnny, you can't end that without adding bro, dude, man, <laughs> because if you don't, I have no way of knowing if you mean phileo, agape, or eros. <laughs> So from now on, end with bro, dude, or man. And he simply said, Sam, I love you. <laughs> That's it. You remember the first time you said I love you to somebody? Not your parents, not your mom. I mean, a person <laughs> that you love. <laughs> moms, come on moms, you know what I mean. The first time I said it to a girl, she said, Hmm. And the next day, she broke up with me. The second time, I prepared myself. Maybe I didn't say it right. Maybe I need to put a little more breath into it. Maybe a little more Hispanic accent. I love you. And this girl looked at me, patted me on my cheek, and said, Aww. That's <laughs> so sweet. Like you would pat a little puppy or your little cousin who just said it to you. No, I, I had hoped that she would moisten her lips and go, I love you too. We're going to learn to say I love you to each other this afternoon. And I know there's enough British in you that it makes it a little bit uncomfortable for you, I know. <laughs> but if we accomplish just one thing this afternoon is this, we're gonna say, I love you, into each other's eyes without, without having to explain whether it is phileo, agape, or eros. We're gonna say, I love you. John 21. There's a scene in John 21 that is so beautiful and so much a few minutes this afternoon won't do it justice, but I will try. The scene in John 21, we'll pick it up in verse 7, is like this. Lake Galilee at dawn, beautiful, still, like Lake Macquarie on a beautiful morning without the kookaburros squawking. <laughs> the disciples are in a little boat floating about 100 yards away from the shore. Peter and six disciples seven of them total. One of them is missing. Judas is no longer in the picture. So that's the majority of the disciples. They've retreated 80 miles from Jerusalem, the center of action, all the way to Galilee. And now they're on a boat 100 yards away from the shore. They've been there all night fishing. They've caught nothing. They've retreated to a comfortable place, a safe harbor. Sometimes we do that, or we're tempted to do that. When things get hard in life, we like to retreat into the comfort of what we know, what we do well, as opposed to being challenged to grow and to follow, to do the hard things Jesus calls us to do. We like to look back instead of forward. When our dreams are shattered, when things don't go our way, hear me, people, hear me. When church boards don't make the decisions we want them to make. When someone lobs insults or undermines our ministry, when we see our leaders crucified, we're tempted to go back to whatever's safe. Peter and his, his friends had retreated into a safe and familiar place, fishing. But remember, Jesus didn't say when he called us, you'll be healthy, wealthy, successful, powerful, stress-free, well-fed, popular, safe, admired, loved, liked, appreciated, accepted, 
and your church will grow. Jesus didn't say any of that. He didn't also did not say, follow me, we'll walk around Palestine for three years, I'll perform miracles of the Roman, then the Romans in collusion with the Jewish leaders are going to crucify me in a horrible way. Then they're going to persecute you and your family and your friends. Everyone's going to die. Come, follow me. <laughs> Who's in? He simply said this, you, you will do something more significant with your life than just pulling fish out of this sea. Come, follow me. You're going to change lives. You're going to change the world. That's it. But there they are in this boat, confused. Uh, let's look at this from Jesus' perspective. On that morning, he's standing on the shore. They didn't recognize him. Mark Twain says, I love this, his real name is Samuel. <laughs> you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. I would say, you can't depend on your eyes when your faith is out of focus. They didn't recognize Jesus on the shore, but he is on the shore. Again, like he was when he called them. Luke, verse, Luke chapter 4. He's on the shore of Lake Galilee like he will always be on the shore of Lake Galilee calling us. He's on the shore because he believes that we are the team. <laughs> you imagine Jesus standing on the shore looking at those seven disciples thinking, you're the team. Three years with you. The seven of you are going to change the world. And you're there, fishing. I imagine Jesus stands on the shores of Galilee every day and he looks down at us. You, in this dome, Alamo Dome, you're the ones that are going to change the world. You, at this lady's chapel in Kurumbang, you're the ones. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus has faith in us. Wow. So he calls them in a place that's familiar to them, a place of retreat, a place where they're working, not at the one project, not a church, not a big camp, not at a Pathfinder camp, or not a mission trip to Ningen. It, he calls them in the middle of their work, in the most unexpected of places. And often when it's the least convenient, when you're getting off your shift and you're tired and you want to go home, soak your feet in hot water or whatever it is you do here to relax. <laughs> Jesus calls you then, like he calls these disciples. So there's Lake Galilee at dawn, still, quiet. The boat, they're probably just looking at the water now thinking, there is nothing alive in this water today. And then Jesus says, throw your net on the other side. And here's where we pick it up, verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, yes, we know, John, he loved you, we know, <laughs> said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. So full of emotion, he put clothes on to jump into the water. Follow this? <laughs> jump into the water. Instead of doing the opposite, which is, hey, whatever. <laughs> the other disciples followed him in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were, they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. This burning coals is intentional. It is intentional. What John wants us to know is that there's another fire of burning coals similar to the one that was burning in the palace of Caiaphas. <laughs> Similar to the one that they were warming themselves at when Peter betrayed Jesus. There's another fire available for Peter. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged Ned ashore. He's strong. What, do, you, do you catch this? So the other disciples couldn't manage it. All six of them, Peter goes back and goes, give me this, back into the shore. That's just my, maybe my imagination. <laughs> it was, a, it was uh, full of large fish, 153. There's a sermon there. We're going to skip it today. But even with so many of the men, it was not torn. Um, Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. None of the disciples there asked, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. For the first time, Peter is speechless. 
He had no, nothing to say. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. He's passing out fish and bread. This is the last breakfast. We celebrate the last supper, but not the last breakfast. We should. Fish sounds tasty in the morning. <laughs> and this was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The first time was to a woman, Mary Magdalene. The second time it was to a doubter, Thomas Didymus. Tom Diddy, if he was living nowadays, he'd be a rapper. <laughs> and now, <laughs> stay with me. And now to Peter, who betrayed him. Those are the three people he appears to primarily. A woman, a doubter, and Peter. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, John, son of John, do you love me more than these? Oh, and here we go. Ooh. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? We have no idea what these means. Look at the commentaries. Jesus could be asking him, do you love me more than all these things you use for fishing? Your, your old life, your, the stuff that I called you from, do you love me more than that? Do you love me more than the rest of these disciples? It could be that. Do you love me more than these? All we know for sure is that Jesus is asking Peter the question, do you love me? Again, Jesus, uh, Peter re replies, yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You've, you've scanned me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know that I love you. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. Three observations and then we're done. Number one, I love you. I love you. Learn to say it, friends. Let's learn to say it to each other. I love you. I love you. Good. Yes, there you go. I love you. Look into someone's eyes and say, I love you. Don't add bro, man, dude. <laughs> say, I love you. Good, good. Good. Here's the thing. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> oh, you're a talkative bunch. What else did you add? I said, I love you, nothing else. <laughs> and that's the problem. We add so much to you sort of soften the awkwardness. I love you. Ha ha, have you been to lunch? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Say, I love you. Just leave it at that. We're going to sing in a moment. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We're assembling. <laughs> Why is it so hard for us to just leave it at that? I love you. I love you. We know it commits us. Like it does when we whisper it to a child. A newborn in our hands. We know it commits us. Like it does when we whisper it to a sweetheart. Like it does when we admit it to an estranged parent. Like it does when we reveal it to a sibling. A sibling maybe that we're estranged from also. Like it does when we offer it to a lonely friend. Do you remember the first time you said I love you and truly meant it to someone? I love you. I love you. We're nervous saying it because those words spoken, you can no longer avoid the implications of saying those words for your life. Once you say I love you to somebody, you're in a relationship. You've made a covenant. The minute Peter hears this question, the minute we hear this question, we have a choice to make. We can either keep talking about Jesus, we can either keep talking about things about Jesus, we can talk about his deeds, about his sayings, about, or we can actually Respond like Peter did, finally, you know my heart, Jesus. I love you. Do you love me? Do you love me? One author puts it this way. Sometimes it's easier to talk about Jesus and to express our devotion to him. 
I think I'm holding nothing back, and then I realize that caring about Jesus with my mind or through the books on my shelf is not the same as giving over the full allegiance of my life. It's a bit like the difference between talking about a loved one and actually picking up the phone and telling that person that you love them. Do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? Second observation, Peter says, uh, Jesus says, feed my sheep. <laughs> it was interesting. Every time Jesus, ans Jesus asks the question and there's a response, it is always followed with, feed my sheep. What took Peter three times to get and what takes us all a lifetime to practice is that Jesus' question about loving and his command about feeding are tied. They're one thing. Loving Jesus means feeding the sheep. It means protecting the sheep. It means caring for the sheep. It means sacrificing for the sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. When you've done it unto the least of these, says Jesus, you've done it unto me. Final observation is the one we love. We love this one. Jesus asks Peter three times, three separate times, do you love me? In part because we understand this as the gospel's way of canceling out each of Peter's shameful denials of Jesus on the night he was arrested and betrayed. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. This is how awesome Jesus is. He not only forgives us, he restores us. And there's a chance that you are here today because you feel like you've blown it so badly. There's a chance some of us are here today and we think we're not really useful to our family, our friends, our church, our community. And perhaps the most important thing I can say to you today and the most important message of this story from the life of Peter is this. Not only does Jesus say you're forgiven, Jesus says, feed my sheep. And he ends this conversation with Peter by saying, follow me. I'm always in motion. Follow me. Come with me. I need you. I need you. I need you. It's my friend Johnny who says, I love you to me all the time. Um, one day I finally said, Johnny, you've got to stop this. <laughs> <Just don't. laughs> Some of us just don't understand it. No, um, we're men. We say, bro, I hope you're doing good, man, or, but I love you. Um, so Johnny says uh, one day to me, Sam, I lost a friend in a tragic car accident, and every day since I've lost this friend, I've made a commitment that I'll never never end a conversation with someone that I love without letting them know I love you. And I want you to know that saying I love you to you is my commitment to you. If you call me in the middle of the night one day because I've said I love you to you so many times, <laughs> I better, I better put my life where my mouth has been. I love you. And Jesus asks today, he asks you, he asks me, do you love me?